We are honored this morning, privileged, to have Dr. Kelvin Cochran with us to bring this morning's message. In case you don't know all of his story, let me share a little bit about Dr. Cochran. He has served for over 30 years in fire departments in both Louisiana and in Georgia. In fact, in 2008, he, he was appointed fire chief for the city of Atlanta Fire Rescue Department. Then in 2014, we watched as Dr. Kelvin Cochran paid a very high price for sharing his Christian beliefs about sexuality and marriage in a Bible study that he had written for Christian men. But what Satan meant for evil, God meant for good. Amen. Dr. Cochran now serves as senior fellow and vice president for Alliance Defending Freedom, which is the world's largest legal organization committed to defending religious liberty, parental rights, family, and the sanctity of human life. He is married to uh, Carolyn. He has three children and one beautiful granddaughter. I have a growing friendship with Kelvin Cochran, and I just want you to know what a blessing that has been to my life. You're an inspiration and an encouragement to me. Folks, let's give a great Redeemer welcome to Dr. Kelvin Cochran. Thank you. Well, good morning. good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we are rejoicing and expressing our joy and gladness in it. Uh, there is, I was staring, sharing this this morning, it all of a sudden dawned on me as I was approaching uh, the stage this morning, a song we used to sing back at my church in Shreveport, Louisiana, there's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place, and I know it's the Spirit of the Lord. And there's a sweet expression on each face, and I know it's the presence of the Lord. I want to express my gratitude to Pastor Jeff for inviting me to share the celebration of our country's birthday with you today, the 4th of July, and express greetings on behalf of Dr. Craig L. Oliver Sr. and the Elizabeth Baptist Church. I have a scripture that I want to share on the very front end that I believe is fitting for our celebration today. It comes from the 66th number of the book of Psalms, and I want to read verses 8 through 12 for your hearing this morning. I love the King James Version, especially in this particular text, and those scriptures read as follows. O oh, bless our God, ye people, and make the voice of his praise to be heard which holdeth our soul in life, and suffereth not our feet to be moved. Thou, O God, hast proved us. Thou hast tried us as silver is tried. Thou broughtest us into the net. Thou hast laid affliction on our loins. Thou hast caused men to ride over our heads. We have been through fire and through water, but thou broughtest us out into a wealthy place. I want to speak from the theme this morning, giving thanks for America. And there are two points I get to cover in the time that's been allotted to me. The first point is giving thanks for our past, American history. And the second point is united as believers for our future. And you'll find, brothers and sisters, that there are three uh, themes appropriate to this message this morning. There's a theme for rec racial reconciliation, a theme for religious liberty, and a theme for unity of the body of Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, how we praise you and thank you for this day. We honor your presence today in this worship service, and we are here with grateful hearts that you have blessed us to be citizens of the United States of America, the land of the free, and the home of the brave. And now it's 
time, dear God, for me to share the message you have put on my heart to share this morning. I pray that they will see you and me, that they will hear you when I speak, and that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart will be acceptable in your sight and an encouragement to these, my brothers and sisters. And I'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. America is the greatest country in the world, bar none. And because of the freedoms we have in America, we can dream dreams. And all the resources that are necessary to make our dreams come true are here for us in the United States of America. We are only limited, brothers and sisters, in our country by our faith, our education, and our character. As it relates to faith, the more we grow in faith, the, the further we go in America. As it relates to education, the more we know educationally, the further we go in America. And as it relates to character, especially the, the personality and character of Christ, the more we show, the further we go in the United States of America. Here's the big idea behind the message. If we truly believe the gospel is the power of God and that Jesus Christ secured our salvation on Calvary and that we are all one body, we don't need a theory that fosters unforgiveness and condemnation in America. We should not be in a cultural war as believers of truth versus a theory. The Bible, here's the big idea, I'm still in the big idea. The Bible, the infallible, the immutable, the inerrant authoritative word of God is truth and is sufficient. Not only is it truth, but it is sufficient for addressing, as the Bible says, all things that pertain to life and godliness, reconciliation, justice, and unity, all included. Truth is more powerful than a theory. Theory will not change a heart. Theory will not bring reconciliation. Theory will not foster justice. Theory will not unify the body of Christ. Only truth can do that. Only the gospel can do that. So here's point number one, giving thanks for our past. America, brothers and sisters, has been a part of God's divine plan from the very beginning of time before the foundation of the world. Our historical documents and historical artifacts have significant evidence of the sovereignty of God over the United States of America from its very origin. When I was fire chief in Shreveport, Louisiana several years ago, I was attending a program at an elementary school and the third graders at the front end of the program were singing our God Bless America. But not only were they singing the words, brothers and sisters, they were signing the words as they sing. That's pretty amazing for third graders. And every time they sing the word America, they sign the word America by wing, wiggling their little chubby digits and putting their hands together and making a circle. I was curious about that, and I asked the music teacher after the program, was there any significance to signing America in this way? And this is what she told me. She said, yes, Chief Cochran, that means America is many nations coming together as one nation. I believe that's a sign that God's sovereignty has been on the United States of America. In addition to that, in the Constitution of the United States of America, when you think about it, there are many prophetic paragraphs and sentences. Prophetic paragraphs and sentences. I would offer the Bill of Rights at the beginning of it, the, the prophetic statement that we hold these truths are self-evident that all men are created equal and that we are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The reason why I say that those were prophetic words, brothers and sisters, was because at the time they were written, they were not intended to be included of the African slaves. They were prophetic 
words. The preamble of the United States of America is a paragraph, America's mission statement, that I believe is a prophetic statement of the sovereignty of God over the United States of America. You know the words. We were taught in the seventh grade. They start by saying, we the people, we the people of the United States. Uh, the, the, in the preamble, the, uh, the, in order to form a more perfect union. And here's what the preamble is for. To establish justice, to ensure domestic tranquility, to provide for the common defense, to promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. And then it ends with a charge to all Americans in that generation and in the generations to follow, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. The Pledge of Allegiance is another one of those statements that have prophetic, sovereign words that proves the evidence of God's sovereignty over our country. We said it earlier, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, which means unable to be divided with liberty and justice for all. The Christian perspective, what I'm trying to get across this morning, brothers and sisters, of history places all categories of history in the proper context because every story, every story depicts, that depicts events and people from the beginning is his story, A capital H I S. S-T-O-R-Y, his story, every event that captures the story of the world, the story of America, is his story. However, one of the greatest challenges of our walk of faith as believers in this indisputable truth that his story also includes the part of America's story of one of the darkest periods of our nation, the period of slavery. Roots by Alex Haley was one of the most impactful books uh, in American history that turned into a movie, mini series, one of the most impactful in the history of our country. To be quite honest and candid with you, it breaks my heart every time I watch the min movie, mini series, Roots, and I make it a point to watch it at least once a year. Roots informed us of the horrors of that dark period in our then infant nation. I thought about America at the time. Can you really, really, really think about it? America was a baby nation at that time. And given the comparison of the age of America today with the age of other nations, at this point in our history, we, we are like two years old compared to the age of, Amer of other nations. And it explains our behavior. We're behaving like two-year-olds <laughs> in the United States of America. So at the time that we discovered what it was really like in our infant state as our country, when we see the horrific times, our heart is broken. And I can tell you, uh, I used to get angry when I watched how our ancestors were treated, but I don't get angry anymore, and, and I want to tell you why. The reason why I don't get angry anymore when I watch Roots is because I realize that God is sovereign, and God can do whatever He wants to do, whenever He wants to do it, however He wants to do it. And he always has a reason, brothers and sisters, for the things that he allows, according to the great gospel artist, Daryl Coley. God always knows what he's doing at all times. What I'm trying to say is slavery in America did not catch God by surprise. In God's sovereignty, he allowed Africans to be brought to America as slaves. Here's what I learned when I studied that history. Africa was on the eve of social, spiritual, and economic famine. 
Islamic religion was widespread and on the increase. Allah and Muhammad were getting more glory and being exalted above the Most High God and Jesus Christ during that period of time. Many Africans were being killed for refusing to become Muslims and during the African Islamic movement. Christianity at that time was being suppressed and oppressed, uh, and it is still being suppressed and oppressed in that part of the country of Africa even today. God was about to pronounce a judgment on West Africa, so he brought six million Africans through the Middle Passage to America as slaves. Another six million were dispatched to other nations and brothers and sisters. Millions died due to the horrific conditions of the slave ships and were thrown overboard. But just as it was God's divine plan to enslave the nation of Israel in his sovereignty, he allowed Africans to be brought to America in bondage. In the book of Genesis chapter 15, we get the story of God's own people that he shared with his chosen father of many nations, Abraham, when he said, your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and they will be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. But I will punish the nation that enslaves them, and afterwards they will come away with great wealth. God knew that Israel was going to go into slavery before Abraham even had Isaac in his sovereignty. He shared that news with Abraham. In the same manner, the African slaves were brought to America under the sovereign watch of God and planted in the religious Christian South. The slave owners were avid about their Christian religious practices and traditions. Sunday school teachers had a tradition of rehearsing their Sunday school lessons on the slaves week after week. Some of the preachers practiced their Bible reading and their sermons on the obedient house slaves. The slaves would gather around the church on Sunday mornings to see how the Sunday school lessons went and how the sermons would go. They were eavesdropping on the preaching and the teaching. African slaves could not read. They were not allowed to read, and so hymn books and Bibles did not do them any good. But they could hear. I'm about to shout right here. <laughs> but by the sovereignty of God, it was a part of his order from the very beginning that faith would not come by reading, but faith would come by hearing. And hearing the word of God brought salvation in Jesus Christ to the slaves. That's why they began to sing songs in the cotton fields back in the day, brothers and sisters. And some of you may not even know this. They made up hymns on their own because they couldn't read the books. They sing a hymn, I'm bound for the promised land. I'm bound for the promised land. Oh, who will come and go with me? I'm bound for the promised land. Up above my head, I hear music in the air. There must be a God somewhere. All born through their salvation in Jesus Christ. By the sovereignty of God in bondage, Christians were made of, slaves were made Christians by the thousands. By the sovereignty of bond, God in bondage, a legacy of faith in Jesus Christ and a culture of worship was born. It was their legacy of faith that believed that led to the Emancipation Proclamation, leading to a legacy of patriotism as Americans, leading to the 13th Amendment, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. This is his story. This is our story. This is our song. My life and presence here even today is proof that God got it right. I am a descendant of African slaves a little boy raised in the deep south on faith and patriotism by a single mom with five siblings on welfare and food stamps, dreamed of being a firefighter at five years old. And by faith and patriotism, my dream came true, becoming a firefighter in Shreveport, Louisiana, and later a firefighter, a fire chief in 
uh, Atlanta, Georgia, being appointed by President Obama to be the head of the United States Fire Administration, the highest fire official in the country. A year later, being brought back to the city of Atlanta, <laughs> serving as fire chief for the city of Atlanta, where God put it on my heart to write a book for Christian men. The title of the book is who told you that you were naked? And when you heard the title, you probably say, well, no wonder you got fired. <laughs> Brought on as a client for Alliance Defending Freedom, a Christian law firm I had never heard before, hired by the Elizabeth Baptist Church to be their chief operating officer. Four years later, vindicated uh, and made whole through the godly attorneys of Alliance Defending Freedom, became a board member of Alliance Defending Freedom, and a few months later now serving as a vice president for Alliance Defending Freedom. Married my fourth grade girlfriend and been married for 39 years and have three wonderful children, one wonderful granddaughter. Nobody but God can make up a story like that. That's God's story. We all came here on different boats, but now we're on the same boat. And if we could just quiet it, our souls enough this 4th of July to reflect on the sovereignty of God, His goodness and His mercies, we would all cry out as Christians, Americans, Christian Americans, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praises shall continually be in my mouth. Thank God for our history. Thank God for the United States of America. Now, as American Christians from different nationalities and different ethnicities, we can sing that old patriotic song, this land is your land, this land is my land, from California to the New York Islands, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters, this land was made by God for you and for me. Can I get an amen? So that's point number one, thanking God for our past. Here's point number two, standing united for our future. By the grace of God, we have been allowed to live out our faith under the protection of the government here in the United States. As a nation founded in large degree on biblical values codified in the Constitution, America has become a great nation because of religious liberty. America has become prosperous because of religious liberty. And the American dream is achievable for all Americans because of religious liberty. But now that we've been so bountifully blessed over the years and government protection for the public expression of our faith has become fragile, too many sons and daughters of God are afraid to speak the truth for fear of the consequences that comes from not conforming to the precepts of moral relativism relativism in an effort, brothers and sisters, to avoid the punitive power of cancel culture. And as a result, the redeemed of the Lord, who have been blessed of the Lord, are afraid to say so. And there is a significant need for the body of Christ to rise to unprecedented levels of unity and solidarity regarding religious liberty. Our divisions as the body of Christ by religious and secular standards, can I tell you, it has diluted the collective power and influence that we have as children of God. As Christians, everything we do, everything we do, as individuals and as the church, should work towards the prime directive of glorifying God, making disciples, spreading the gospel, and showing the world the love of Christ as a unified body of believers the United Christians of the United States of America. Lord, let it be so. The question becomes, are you prepared to do your part to stand against the enemies of the sanctity of life, the enemies of biblical marriage, the en enemies of biblical family, and the enemies of religious liberty? You may ask the question, well, Brother Kelvin, how do I know if I'm prepared to do my part? Well, being from the emergency services industry for 34 years, I prepared 
for that question because I knew you were going to ask it this morning. (laughs) And I have a checklist of things that if you can check one or more of these things, you are prepared to do your part to unify the body of Christ. Here's checklist number one. You know you are prepared to do your part if you spend more time rejoicing about what God is doing rather than complaining about what our enemies are doing. It is impossible for faith and fear to join together and to be together at the same time in a believer of God. And we should not be complaining about what our enemies are doing because the Bible says the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Number two, you are prepared to do your part if you're more faithful in what God can do than you are fearful in what your enemies can do. Sons and daughters of God who stand shoulder to shoulder and toe to toe to face persecution will always win. Here's number three. You know you're prepared to do your part to stand when you are more inspired by the promises that God has made than you are paralyzed over the threats our enemies are making. The Bible says that God laughs at the threats of our enemies. So if God is laughing at the threats of our enemies, as his children, we should also be laughing. Here's number four. You know you're prepared to do your part if you are more empowered by the words that God is speaking than you are anxious over the words our enemies are speaking. They do have a lot to say, but God has the final say. And here's the fifth thing to assess, to determine if you are prepared. You know you are prepared to do your part when you acknowledge the omnipotent authority of the Most High God over the position, power, and influence over our enemies. They do have some power. The Honorable Mayor Kasim Reed, who terminated me, he had some power. But can I tell you that God has all power, and he will vindicate his sons and daughters who have the courage and grace to stand. (laughs) Brothers and sisters, the enemy has stolen a strategy out of God's playbook. Well, what do you mean, Brother Kelvin? Remember the stories in the Bible when God's army was faced with seemingly insurmountable odds and were outnumbered by their enemies? God would create the perception of a sudden and overwhelming threat within the enemy's camp, and the soldiers would begin to fight amongst themselves. By the time God's armies arrived to the battlefield, all their enemies would have killed themselves and were dead or have fled. The only thing Israel or Judah's army had to do was to collect all the spoils. What I'm saying here is Satan has stolen that strategy out of God's playbook. Well, what do you mean, Brother Kelvin? He has created the perception of an overwhelming threat and has weaponized race, denominations, and political parties, causing sons and daughters of God to fight among ourselves. And if we continue to allow ourselves to be used by the enemy, attacking one another and fleeing, he will harvest the spoils of our marriages, the spoils of our families, the spoils of our children, the spoils of our livelihoods, the spoils of our neighborhoods, and even the spoils of our great country. And we cannot allow the enemy to have the high ground. Brothers and sisters, our alignment by race and denomination and political party, and even in some cases geographical lines, have allowed the influence of popular culture and political correctness to become more influential on sons and daughters of God and American culture than the Judeo-Christian values of which our nation has been established. The passive display of our faith in this divided state does little value and has proven to be politically impotent on issues of biblical values such as marriage, family, and the sanctity of life. As God's people and as God's church, we have got to demonstrate biblical unity on these truths across racial lines, across denominational lines, and across political party lines. We should not be in a struggle on 
whose side will we stand on when it comes to the gospel and where we will stand when it comes to what God says about marriage, what God says about family, what God says about the sanctity of life, and what God says about justice and freedom. No matter how large or influential a Christian denomination, ministry, or organization might be, we do not have enough resources in a divided state, brothers and sisters, to fight all the wars that are waged against the gospel. But together, united as one body, we have more than enough resources to stand and fight and win for the glory of God. However, if we continue to choose sides and disassociate ourselves with other believers who have other interests, as we have been guilty of doing, the enemy will continue to take the high ground, denigrating our values and our Christian witness, suppressing our expressions of faith, that are guaranteed in the Constitution. I'm concerned, brothers and sisters, that if we remain divided, passive, and silent, our 4th of July in years to come for our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren will not be a celebration but a memorial service of the freedoms we once had in the United States of America. Lord, let it not be so. We can stop it in our generation. As sons and daughters of God, we have a responsibility to reset our priorities, set our differences aside, and embrace a unified movement to fight for the body of Christ, for religious freedom, for the glory of God. In the book of John, chapter 17, verses 20 through 21, Jesus prayed to the Father, Lord, that they may be one as you and I are one. And here's why he was praying that prayer, that the world may know that you sent me. What that's saying to us, our divided state is preventing the world from seeing Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. So as we celebrate the 4th of July, let us resolve today like Joshua, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And let us resolve not to allow our pervasive schisms and our institutionalized seditions to prevent the world from seeing Jesus Christ. Let us give thanks for our past. God is sovereign. Let us give thanks for our present. God is good. And let us give thanks for our future. God has it completely in his hands. Let us give thanks for the United States of America. I wish I could sing. I can't sing. But if I could sing, I would end this message with one of my most favorite, most patriotic American songs. And I don't know about you, but I'm proud to be an American. <laughs> proud to be an American. And if tomorrow I lost all the things, I'd work for all my life. And I had to start again with just my children and my wife. I thank my lucky stars to still be living here today because the flag still stands for freedom and they can't take that away. I'm proud to be an American where at least I know I'm free. And I won't forget the men and the women and the slaves who died who gave that right to me. And I'll gladly stand up just like you just did next to you and defend her still today. There ain't no doubt we love this land. God bless the USA. Let us pray. Father, how we thank you. We praise you for your sovereignty. You've got it all figured out. And you're crying out to your sons and daughters here in the United States of America, the land of the free, the home of the brave that you established before the foundation of the world. Uh, that we have hope in the unity of the body of Christ. We have hope. Jesus paid for our reconciliation on Calvary over 2,000 years ago. And through the love that we share for one another, we can bring liberty and justice for all. We give you praise as we celebrate America's birthday today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.
Thank you for watching this video on First Redeemer's YouTube channel. If you enjoyed it, click like below and leave us a comment. And if you'd like more content like this, click subscribe and turn on your notifications. Thanks again for watching.